Proverbs 16 and verse 33. And there's one verse that I want to read for our hearing this morning found there in Proverbs 16 and verse 23. There we'll find these words written. The lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is of the Lord. Thus in the reading of God's word. I want to encourage you this morning from this thought why God will win. Why God will win. We are on the threshold of a very important election. This election also could be very historic as well. As with all elections, there comes with it many uncertainties. Uh, but if you've been keeping up with things, particularly on the national level, one thing is for certain, and that is there are some tough days ahead. Now, I'm not suggesting or even uh, given a gloom and doom forecast. But I will submit that because of what we are seeing, it needs to be realized that at this point in time, the church needs to be as prayerful and vigilant as she's ever been. I don't believe we have ever witnessed a political climate like we are seeing now. And it seems as if the real issues of our nation have gotten lost in the midst of all the political rhetoric, accusations, whether real or perceived, personal agendas, and just some plain old foolishness. Let me reassure you, my brothers and sisters, that regardless of your political affiliation or your position or your personal preferences or persuasion, no matter who has promised what, knowing they won't fulfill those promises. No matter what the polls or the political pundits may say, God is still sovereign. God is still sovereign. That means he is in total control of everything that's happening. And because God is sovereign, God always wins. Now, as believers, we just can't believe that as on GP, general principle. But we must be unequivocally con convinced of it and know without a shadow of a doubt that he's got the whole world in his hand. As I've considered what's been going on in the world, um, I've had to keep myself from getting caught up in all the hoopla. And remember that this election does not determine my destiny. All right. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it may have an effect on some policies and some laws that might govern some things that concerns our welfare to a certain extent. But the overall welfare and destiny of my life and yours is in the Lord's hand. And as I preached several Sundays ago, my constant plea and prayer is, Lord, keep your hands on my life. The text this morning is under consideration. It says, the lot is cast in the lap, but the whole disposing thereof is the Lord. Casting lots was a method used by the Jews in the Old Testament and by Christian disciples prior to Pentecost to help determine the will of God. Lots could be uh, sticks with certain markings on them or stones with symbols or etc. And they were thrown into a small area and the results were interpreted. Scripture cites many instances of people casting lots and it was this method that was used when important decisions were made but there was not enough evidence uh, that had already been provided through wisdom and or the scripture. And as far as scripture seems to indicate, God never condemned the casting of lots. In Leviticus chapter 16, verse 8, that's 
Leviticus 16, verse 8, it says, And Aaron cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. First Chronicles 25 and 8 says, And they cast lots for their duties, all alike, the small as well as the great, the teacher as well as the pupil. In Psalms 22, 18, it says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And then Matthew 27, 35 is the fulfillment of that verse in Psalm 22 where it says, And when they had crucified him, talking about Jesus, they divided up his garments and among them cast lots. That's where a lot of folk get not shooting dice from because that's what they did with Jesus. Acts chapter 1, verse 26 says, And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven. See, in the New Testament, after Judas had hung himself, the disciples cast lots to see who would be his replacement. And the lot, the Bible says, fell to Matthias, but this was before Pentecost or the coming of the Holy Spirit in the church. Now, since the New Testament does not have any instances of Christians casting lot uh, to discern the will of God after Pentecost, we can conclude that after the arrival of the Holy Spirit, we do not need to rely on the method of casting lots, but instead we got to re rely on the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the further revelation that's found in the Scriptures. And as we are led by the Holy Spirit and guided by the Word of God, we need to understand that God always wins in any situation because here's my first point. Life's outcomes are determined by God's sovereignty and not man's strategy. Life's outcomes are determined by God's sovereignty and not man's strategy. In Romans chapter 9, uh, we're given a good example of the sovereignty of God concerning the birth of Abraham's son Isaac and his grandson Jacob. Now, we know how God had determined to bless Abraham and his seed and how Abraham tried to strategize and help God out by having Ishmael. But God didn't need his help, and he doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help with his plans. He doesn't need our advice or our input. And therefore, uh, Isaac was born as heir to the promise just as God had determined. And then Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Now, during that time, the norm is that the eldest is to rule the clan after the father's gone on, which meant Esau was supposed to be the heir. But now the Bible says that the purpose of God, for the purpose of God, things are going to be changed. And when you read Acts chapter 9 and continue around verse 7 through 12, it says, For the children yet being not being born, talking about Esau and Jacob, neither having done good or evil, but that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth, it was said of her, the elder shall serve the younger. God flipped the script on the thing. God, his divine sovereignty, elects Isaac over Ishmael and Jacob over Esau. And it had nothing to do who was better than the other or who's the smartest. But it was the sovereignty of God in spite of man's strategies. Yeah, we, we may have a strategy, but God is sovereign. And he determines the outcome of all things. So don't, don't be discouraged or disappointed when things don't look like they're going to turn out in your favor. Because victory sometimes has been snatched out of the hands of defeat many times at the last second. I, I mean, I was watching uh, 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 the, the World Series game, game one, uh, the World Series, and, and it looked like the Dodgers were going to lose. And Freddie Freeman came up to the bat, and for the first time in the history of the World Series, hit a walk-off grand slam to beat the Yankees. And I just knew, bro, Greg, I just knew that our Chicago Bears were going to defeat the Washington Commanders, and yet with no time on the clock, Jaden Daniels threw a 54-yard Hail Mary after scrambling around for 13 seconds 
to win the game. A Hail Mary. Now, 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 those are games in life, but they're not important as the game of life. And if victory can be won with no time by man's strategy, how much more can victory be won by the God who controls time because of his sovereignty? Uh, he may not come when you want it, but I declare he's always on time. Uh, here, 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 here's my second point uh, 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 why God will win God will win also because God doesn't need 50 plus 1 because he's a majority of 1 he, he doesn't need 50 plus 1 he, he's a majority of 1 see we put a lot of stock in numbers and for all practical purposes usually the majority wins. Let me see if I can make an analogy this morning. <clears throat> in football, it's illegal to play with 12 men on the field. Both teams are only allowed 11 men on the field at one time. But if you're familiar with the Texas A&M Aggies, when they play in their home stadium, they have an official 12th man. Well, how did that come about? I'm glad y'all asked me that. Bill told y'all asked me so. I'm glad. On January 2nd in 1922, E. King Gill, that's his name, E. King Gill, he was a basketball player and former member of the Texas A&M football team. And he was in the stands during a game, the Dixie Classic they were having, as the Texas A&M Aggies were facing the top-ranked center college. They were undefeated. And they were outgunned. And all uh, Texas A&M players pretty much were injured. Well, the coach at that time looked up and saw Gill in the stands, called him down to the field, and suited him up. And he stood ready to play throughout the game, and he became known as the 12th man. That's how it got started. And it became the biggest upset in college football history because the Aggies went on to beat them 22 to 14. The 12th man. You don't see him on the field. He doesn't run. He doesn't punt. He doesn't throw a pass. He doesn't tackle. He doesn't play defense. During the game, he's never on the field, but he has a way of affecting the play on the field. Uh, stay with me for the all don't know about football. See, see, the 12th man has been identified as the nauseous fans in college football. And, and matter of fact, Texas A&M got so good at thing, they were allowed, and what they did, they let the Seattle Seahawks uh, buy into their name. And you see them talking about the 12th man in Seattle. They are all around the stadium. And when the team needs energizing, they get louder. When the team needs to disrupt the other team's ability to hear the signal from their quarterback, they get even louder. And because they are all around the stadium, the opposition has to deal with a 12th man, but it's legal. Yeah. All right, that's the analogy. Y'all say, okay, we're past what is in the Bible. Let me give you a scripture to help you out with that. In 2 Kings chapter 6, the king of Syria is upset because every time he tries to plan a surprise attack against the king of Israel, Elijah, the prophet of God, sends the king of Israel a word not to go that way. Yeah. All right? He says, uh, king... Go another way. Uh, uh, don't go there. He, he, he's waiting there for you, so don't, don't go that way. And this happened so much that the king of Syria said, is there somebody on our side that's working for us, working for them? He said, somebody is leaking information. And his servant said, well, no, king, uh, nobody's leaking information. Uh, it's that Elijah fella. Uh, somehow he seems to know your every move. As a matter of fact, King, everything you say in your bedroom, he knows it. He's the one that's dropping dimes on you to Israel. <laughs> and so the king of Syria said, well, I need to find that fella and hush him up. Anybody know where he is? And they said, well, King, last time I heard he was down in Dothan. 
And so the king said, well, take some horses and chariots and, and take the army down there with you and, and go surround the city and get that fellow and bring him here. Well, they went down, they surrounded the city, and the Bible says the next morning when Elisha's servant got up and went outside, he saw the army of horses and chariots all around the city. He comes back and asks, Elijah, Master, what shall we do? Elijah tells him, oh, don't be afraid, don't worry about it, don't be afraid, because those who are with us are more than those that's with them. I can imagine the servant looking around and saying, okay, he said, those that are with us are more than those with them. Uh, uh, Master Elijah, uh, didn't you hear me say it was an army around the city and it's just two of us last time? I mean, one, two, it's just two of us. But Elijah said, don't worry about it. We got a 12th man. You can't see him with the natural eye, but he's there. And the Bible said Elijah prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened his eyes, and, and when his eyes were open, he saw chariots of fire all around Elijah. <laughs> Listen, when you think you are outnumbered, God says, I'm a majority of one. And when, when, when it seems like the odds are against you, God says, I'm a majority of one. And if God be for us, Who can be against us? David said in Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and they fell. Though a host should encamp against me and though what my heart is not going to fear, though war should rise against me. I wish I had some Bible readers in here. He said, I miss I'm my heart. I'm going to be confident. One thing. Yeah, I'm getting happy, y'all. One thing I've desired, that I might seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, anybody been in trouble before? In the time of trouble, he said, he shall hide me. Ah, in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle, shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. In other words, he is my stability. Doesn't matter what lot is cast. The disposing of it or the results of it belong to God. It's in his hands. And because it's in his hands, here's my last point. I'm going to let you go. God always wins. <laughs> because in his hands, God, God always, always wins. No matter what the situation is, God always wins. Yes, uh, in Matthew 27, beginning around verse 25 and following, the Bible says that there was a feast at the feast that they had. That the, the governor had the ability to release a prisoner to the people who they wanted. And they had a notable prisoner, the Bible says, by the name of Barabbas. Notable in the fact that everybody knew him. He was a habitual offender. They knew he wasn't no good. And therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said, who, who do you want me to give to you? Uh, uh, release Barabbas or the one named Jesus who was called Christ? He knew that they had brought Jesus because they envied him. They was mad at him. And, and then when he went down and sat in his Judgment Hall, his wife came to him and said, uh, uh, Pilate, uh, honey, don't, don't, don't have nothing to do with that man. If I've suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And men, when your wife starts dreaming about another man, you got some trouble. You can take that like that. Yeah, that he said, I, I've had some, I, I've suffered some because of him in some dreams. But the chief priest and the elders of the Bible said they kept on and they kept uh, pressing the multitude to, to keep on asking for Barabbas. And then Pilate came and said, well, well, who should I release you, uh, uh, Barabbas or Jesus? They said, give us Barabbas. They said, but what I'm going to do with this Jesus? They said, crucify him. They said, but what evil has he done? He, he hadn't done anything. 
Yeah, we don't care. Crucify him anyway. And Pilate saw that he couldn't prevail over them. The Bible says he took some water, washed his hands, and said, I'm innocent of the blood of this just man. So you do what you want to do with him. And then the people answered, and don't miss this. The people said, his blood be on us and on our children. Uh, and I believe uh, the blood is still on some of the children. Uh, uh, blood that saw a race of people taken from their homeland and, and brought to a new land and was made to work and make the land prosper, but were denied the privileges of owning the land they helped to build. Blood is still on their hands. Blood that saw civil war rip through families where a race of people were treated worse than animals. Their children sold like cattle, their women abused and degraded, their men beaten and bruised, all for a bale of cotton. Blood is still on some hands. Blood that saw uh, a civil rights movement spring out of a hope that life would be better for a race of people who were also made in the image of God, yet they found themselves hanging from the ends of ropes, chased and bitten by police dogs, houses burned and, and churches bombed, children denied the right to a decent education, workers denied the right to equal wages, and all of them denied the right to vote blood. Still on some folks' hands. And, 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 when, and when three young men came to help get them the right to vote, they killed them and buried their bodies in an earthen dam. And they walk around talking about they want to be just and fair. But blood, still on some hands. Uh, well, Pilate, Pilate thought that he could wash his hands with water and symbolically be cleansed from the blood of Christ. He, he thought he would be absolved of his sin, but I'm sorry, Pilate. Water won't do it. Water can't wash you from your sin, but I know what will. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of of Jesus. They wanted a known criminal. They wanted a known insurrectionist. They wanted a felon. They wanted someone knowing that what he had done before, if given a second chance, he was going to do it again. And to get him released, they trumped up charges and lies just to do it. But thanks be to God for our 12th man, because our 12th man, unlike the other 12 men, he just don't sit in the stands and make noise. But our 12th man sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for those that belong to him. And the way that he did it was not by hell, Mary. But by a virgin named Mary, he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born in a lonely manger, grew up in a ghetto called Nazareth, baptized by John in the Jordan, affirmed with the spirit of the Father. And the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. You got to hear him. And after 40 days, um, he overcame temptation of the devil in the wilderness. And, and after three hours, uh, he defeated the devil uh, on the cross uh, where he suffered, uh, he bled, uh, and he died. Uh, he was buried uh, in a borrowed tomb uh, for three days and nights. Uh, and just like uh, it seemed like, uh, I said, just when uh, it seemed like, uh, the game of life was over. He hit a walk-off grand slam uh, when he arose from the grave uh, with all power and authority in his hand. Uh, that's why God uh, always wins because uh, Jesus uh, is the goat. Uh, he's the God uh, over all things. Uh, 
I'm through preaching to her, but I'm happy this morning because uh, he's able. He's able to do anything but fail. Uh, that's why God uh, always wins because uh, he's able uh, to do anything but fail. Uh, you just put your trust in him uh, and he'll never let you down. Uh, and I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad he's able to do anything but fail and remind us that God always wins. Remember life's outcome. Your life and my life as children of God is not determined by the strategies of men, but by the sovereignty of God. Remember, as God's children, understand that, 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 that God doesn't need 50 plus one. He's a majority of one. And, and, and don't forget, because you God's child, you win. Because God always wins. He won it for us at Calvary. If you place your faith and trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be a winner. And as the eyes of brother said, winner takes all. Ah. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the fact, oh God, that you always win. It may not be what we think. It may not be how we see it. It may not be what we expect, God, but in your divine sovereignty, you always win. And you know the right plan to use. You gave your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And because of him, we have eternal life. If there's someone who does not know you, know that they have not accepted you as Lord and Savior. I pray, God, that you would touch their heart through your Holy Spirit and your word. They will say, what must I do to be saved? They'll realize that all they got to do is confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in that heart that God raised from the dead. And they shall be saved. For the Bible declares, Heart man believes unto righteousness, and the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you, God, for reminding us that you always win. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Of course, and we're ready to go.